Um, the tech team? I don't have a slide deck. Yes, someone in that group had a slide deck. Who was it? Or was it? I'll be happy if there was none. Uh, might have been Sally, but I did ask her to sort of like send right. it to is you she, because she, I didn't know what to do. Is she that. there? Is she online? Uh, can... Not yet. Okay, so I'm going to. Natisha's here. I'm going to log on. Natisha's here, but Sally is Okay, I'm, I'm going to log on to the online. I'm going to log on now anyhow and see what's going on. And and the um, the audio from the other side is very is very low for me. I'm not quite sure why. In, are you? Um, we're hearing. Are you hearing me? Testing one, two, three. I, I, I can hear you. I can hear you, but it's it's rather faint. Okay, um, tech team, they're saying this audio which we're hearing quite loud here is faint on the Zoom. Is there a reason for that? Do you think? Okay. It was it, it was extremely faint before they when we did a little bit of a test. But, um, all right, they're saying you have to raise your volume. Um, a, yeah, so I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm, 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 I'm at the mercy of the tech talk. team here, so I, I, <laughs> so I will, I will, oh, I, be, I'll be, I see Sally has I, arrived. Um, I'll be guided by them. We can check with her as to whether she's got a slide deck. All right, let me, I'm going into Zoom now. Um, hang on a sec, if I know there's something in Zoom you have to do on this, you have to, yes, allow unmute. All right, so so tech guys, the problem here we have, with, this is not a panelist session. So everybody is going to be speaking, but we only have one mic, two mics. So um, on Zoom, if it is, so on Zoom, can you just unmute all the participants by default? But not, not mm -hmm. unmute them now, but I mean, allow them to speak by default so they can, yep. without having to me to ask. Yep, Do you see fine. That? Yeah, that'll be fine. Good. All right, let me not join it. Oh, I'm not going to join the audio. Okay, that's... All right, seeing 10 people online, that should be fine. Okay, let me join it. All right, so I'm seeing 10 folks online. I don't think they're all tech people, so we have Maureen, um, Tina Captioner, I know who, <laughs> Gabrielle Johnson, Leticia, so you, can, you can probably look at mine as you don't log in, Mohabula, Ochiang, Ochiang, hello Ochiang, and he's our um, remote moderator, remote rapporteur, yes, Patrick Hussein, right, Selu, and Shunan, all right. Selu, um, before we actually, we're going to start shortly, formally. Um, Selu, you had slides. Is that what you, is that what Maureen was saying? I can't recall if it was you or Maureen. You can you can talk. Uh, there, this, uh, oh, should, you I can see you. you. Sorry, you can see us. Now? I said I can see you. Hey, here we go. <laughs> yes, so, I, I sent it through. Selu, you said, did you have slides? Yes, um, I've sent it through. All right, you sent it through to whom? Uh, Tracy and Cherie. Tracy and Cherie. So I have to run the slides. Oh dear. Um, okay. Um, tech team, can she share her screen um, on the on remote? Is that possible? Yes. Okay. So Sido, they said you can share your screen because it'll be difficult for me to run slides. I'm not. not I can't multitask that well at that, this age. Okay. <laughs> I can't chair and run slides too. Sorry, sorry about that. Great. Ah, I'm seeing some nice camera work being done. Fantastic. Good, good. All right. So, any apps near? How did how did it go? All right. I think this this looks like it. All right. So, we're gonna start now. So, just for the recording. One, two, three, we're starting. Okay, so welcome everyone to our IGF 2022 Dynamic Coalition on Small Island Developing States Annual Roundtable. Um, this year we are in beautiful Addis Ababa. There, um, we've been doing virtual, virtual meetings for some time. And of course, as you know what the DC said, we are lucky to have um, small islands in um, on site. So we have quite a, f well, not a f quite a few, but some, um, and some are still coming. 
but our majority of our participants we know will likely be online. Um, so we welcome our participants from the Pacific region, from the Caribbean region, from the Indian Ocean region, and from other parts of the ocean where there are islands that we all um, bring them in. Welcome, Judy. Uh, for those who don't know Judy, Judy is, has joined us today. Judy, my colleague, Judy from Kenya. Not an island, but Judy is a friend of us. And we're seeing coming in the room, June Paris. You're not going to see everybody, but I'm just calling one who I can see. And We also have the Pacific participants here for the IGF with Joe Benz from Samoa and also Vili from Fiji. I think um, Nigel is also on his way. And I'm Shuri Langakali from Fiji, um, representing the Pacific. Uh, um, we did the p first SIDS IGF together virtually, and, and I think we've been doing a couple of virtual sessions. It's nice to finally be here in person and actually see um, in person, like how you introduced us earlier in the flesh. And uh, yeah, thank you for having us, Tracy. And what I could probably do is probably on my right, I'll ask my colleague, um, Secretary General Rodney Taylor, to just say he's here. I'm here. <laughs> and I also have, maybe just, I just want to give my colleague who's just joined the DC SIDS. Um, yeah, maybe you can just introduce yourself. Yes, the mic is coming in. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Thank you, Tracy. So I am uh, Mahan Basgopal, and I am the coordinator of the Mauritius IGF. And uh, we have started the IGF event in Mauritius since 2017, and we extended it to Comoro Islands, Madagascar, and Seychelles. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues who have decided to go to the back, as you can see, we are deliberately trying to come closer. So I invite you, I invite you to come closer. I invite you. We, we try, this is a round table, and we try to do as best as we can. So. Let's make it as round as we can. Judy, you have a, I think it's a better room for you, right, Judy? <laughs> Excellent. All right, so let's go online. So we have um, my co-chair um, of the DC SIDS, Maureen. Maybe you could just introduce yourself. And I guess what we could do in the chat, um, colleagues who are in the chat, I don't want to go around the room and introduce everyone, but in chat, just say where you're from so we can know who's here from um, wherever you're from in the the world, because it wouldn't be only SIDS. But Maureen? Maureen, I think you're going to be, Maureen's going to be on screen, so I'm seeing her. Yeah, right. Th thanks, um, thanks, Tracy, and, and thanks, everyone. Um, yeah, I'm Maureen Halyard. I'm um, sort of uh, uh, Tracy's sort of like co-chair, basically, uh, of the of DC SIDS, um, and I'm from, um, I'm currently in the Cook Islands. So that's me. Thanks, Maureen. Hello. Yep, that's Maureen. Thank you very much. And I said, please use the chat to introduce yourself. And um, for those who know the DC SIT sessions, we are very organic. So what we're going to do is, um, I, Maureen had made a special request to me. To have the Pacific is up very early this morning. It's, it's literally in the wee hours of the morning. So they're going to go first, and Maureen, you're going to lead this um, wave of Pacific interventions. The way we do things, for those who don't know how it works, we have discussants, there are no panelists, and we're going to do some reporting as what's been happening in our region. So, Maureen, Pacific region, and Sherry will intervene as necessary, I would imagine. Maureen, go ahead. Um, okay, so um, do you want me to introduce introduce the other? Yeah, um, yep. you, yeah so, so you, you, take, you take the Pacific, yeah. um, Pacific baton and run with it. Right. Okay. This is the Pacific uh, section. Okay. Well, first of all, let me introduce um, Leticia because she's uh, sort of like was very much a part of the um, of the SIDS um, IGF um, session, and she's the um, chair of the of PICISOC. I think we're just waiting on one more to come from uh, from uh, the Pacific, but we definitely have Salu, and I'm so pleased to have Salu here this time. Um, we had a we had we had to. Uh, she insisted that we had gave her a wake up call to, <laughs> because it's really an awful time for us in the Pacific. But um, you know, like I'm, a, I'm really 
thrilled that, that they're here anyway. But if I can um, perhaps, if I can perhaps start um, on, um, you know, on on my uh, sort of like uh, presentation, and hopefully it's not more than ten minutes because we did say we wanted it um, reasonably short. But really, I just want to welcome everyone um, here. Uh, it's it's really. It's really great to see. I know that you've had a um, had an upset about the room, um, so I'm hoping that people sort of like do do lo locate the, um, the changed room. Um, but you know, whether you're um, in person or or remote, um, it's really great to see you here. But with regards to the SIDS idea, I was so proud that we were actually able to pull it off, and so grateful for the um, for the involvement of um, of CTU. Caribbean um, uh, Telecommunication Union, um, but also the Pacific-based participants who were there in the very early hours of the morning, just as it is today, but as moderators and panellists. And it's, it isn't easy to put together a virtual conference, but I have to mention Cherie, Letitia and Dulcie who, were, who spent months with me beforehand helping Nigel and his amazing um, CTU team to organise the event. And really thanks to their leadership and their commitment to DC SIDS, you know, to give credit to where, you know, where credit is due. So thank you so much, guys. But if I was to single out a couple of takeaways from me from the SIDS IGF event, the first thing that comes to mind, and I'd have to be, would have to be my own session, which I moderated at one o'clock in the morning on the second day. And to be honest, it was, I was really apprehensive about how I was going to converse with my assigned group of technical experts from partner organisations from our regions. But I kid you not, they're the most amazing group of guys and from an internet user perspective, I found the whole session not only enlightening for me, but also a lot of fun. And I know it's supposed to be the other way around, but they really put me at ease. But many thanks to my team of Kevin Swift from LACNIC, Evel Wooding from from um, Aaron, um, Albert Daniels from ICANN's GSE, Pablo Hinojosa from APNIC, who was our Pacific representative, and Nigel Casimir from CTU, who did so much for the, um, for the event. But big thanks to them, not only for the contribution that they make in the technical areas that they serve, but also the important work that they're doing to support community initiatives and to raise awareness and educate internet end users in their communities about a wide range of IG issues. An interesting recommendation for next steps for SIDS that came out of the session was the development of a framework and protocols to research SIDS IG issues that could be used to inform presentations at DC SIDS such as these at the Global IGF. And of course, another reminder that rotating the SIDS IGF would ensure that all SIDS get an opportunity to be involved in the discussions that um, we have about our involvement with the internet. My um, second takeaway was from the presentation given by the Honourable Simon Coffey, the Minister of Justice, Communications and Foreign Affairs from, an island, from the island of Tuvalu in the Pacific. Tuvalu is a small island nation with very low-lying atolls and reef islands of about 11,000 people, but whose land areas are slowly being encroached upon by a very noticeably increasing rise in sea level. Simon spoke of how the pandemic had pushed Tuvalu's government towards prioritising and driving internet connectivity so that they could maintain con connection with their isolated outer island communities through virtual meetings during the lockdowns. But he applauded the SIDS idea, not only for bringing island communities together to share our initiatives, our challenges and achievements, but also because it was an amazing opportunity for fruitful and constructive dialogue. And that is definitely one of our goals. <laughs> My notes organised here. He also explained his country's Future Now project, which is aimed at securing the future of their country against the violent impacts of climate change 
that they are already starting to experience. They're currently pursuing initiatives that involve creating a digital nation by preserving a digital copy of Tuvalu, its government infrastructure, geography, people and culture, something that they believe is really important to do in the event that their land is eventually lost due to climate change and sea level rise. At the same time as they're going through this transformational phase, however, he also stressed that in order to maintain the integrity of what they aim to achieve, they're taking a values-based approach by fusing the positive commonalities that arise out of ICT development with the unique cultural values of their community-based society. So the ICT strengthens rather than undermines their values and can contribute to climate resilient development and innovation adoption to combat climate change impacts. His views on climate change are also reflected by the Minister of ICT and Innovation from Mauritius, the Honourable Deepak Belgolbin. He also mentioned the Samoa pathway, which was developed in 2014. When the Global SIDS meeting was held in Samoa in the Pacific, the Samoa title of their resultant document actually stands for SIDS Accelerated Modalities of Action, which was to provide a comprehen comprehensive framework of action to support sustainable development for small island development. And I must mention, before I go, the, the recent Pacific participation in the Asia-Pacific Regional IGF, which was held in October in Singapore, just before the ICANN meeting. We usually get about one or two people coming along to, um, to an APR IGF meeting. But this year, we had Pacific newcomers from Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Samoa, Fiji, Tonga, and even another Cook Islander from New Zealand speaking on a range of important end user issues. And what's more, their values, their views and contributions would also have been included into the synthesis document that is produced after each APR IGF and presented at the global IGF. So there is one um, in this year's global IGF. But a particular note at the APR IGF this year was the active involvement in both plenaries and workshops of the Minister of ICT from Papua New Guinea, who gave high level perspectives on the, a lot of the IG issues that he, uh, of the sessions that he attended during the week. It's really heartening to see so, much, um, so, many more, um, so much more participation from our government leaders, from the Caribbean, Pacific and Ains regions and our regional IGS. And we look forward to their continued involvement in future events. Thank you. And now I'll pass the floor over to Leticia to give a pick I sock over you as well as a Thank you, Leticia. Can you hear can me? Leticia hear that? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, we can now. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, and it's good to see some familiar faces here today. Hi, everyone. My name is Leticia Masaya, and I'm from the Solomon Islands. Um, as Maureen has said, the current board chair of the Pacific Islands chapter, which is a non-profit, non-government organization with members who have an interest in the internet in the Pacific. Today, I'll share with you some takeaways from the SEEDS IGF, the recent um, SEEDS IGF, as well as some of the GISOX activities in collaboration this year. As Maureen has also already stated, um, I moderated one of the sessions, uh, which was held in collaboration with the Caribbean IGF and CTU. We had a panel of four speakers, Dr. Teresa from the GFCE, Winifred Kula, president and co-founder of the PNG Digital ICT Cluster, Georgina Naigulevo, a former board, a PKSOC board member from Fiji, and Sarai Tevita from the National University of Samoa, who all shared with us their insights on the topic of access, connectivity, and inclusion. 
I would like to thank this wonderful woman for, for their time um, in sharing their experience during the SEEDS IGF. SEEDS IGF provided a space to learn from each other as well as share our experiences. This includes sharing the opportunities that came about during and post pandemic that impacted education, policies and services. According to stats that were shared during the event, there is now an increase in internet connectivity, although it varies from rural and urban areas. And it was highlighted that internet connectivity is crucial, crucial for economic development, access of information, opportunities and service delivery. There is also an opportunity of ongoing digital transformation and digital readiness happening in our small island developing states. There is also ongoing work on e-health and digital and health information roadmap. We also see the development of cybersecurity and online child protection policies coming into place. Accessibility of services online and being inclusive, access to devices, and ongoing online safety, digital literacy and awareness for women entrepreneurs, students, parents, teachers, and the workplace that are, be con that are being conducted by various ICT societies, such as the Tonga Women in ICT, uh, WITSI, Samoa, Information Technology Association, and ICT clusters at the national level. The discussion in my session highlighted the need to increase skill sets, create workforce space in the Pacific for digital health, the need for cybersecurity building within SEEDS. There was, it was also highlighted that there is no representative of a SEEDS in IGF leadership panel, and it was encouraged that our voices need to be heard in this space. It was also highlighted to look into the uh, internet costs that would be affordable to lower middle income poverty line. And it was also highlighted the need for both students, teachers, parents to take responsibility and put your children's education a priority, especially with the new norm of e-learning. At the end of the day, universal and meaningful connectivity is defined as the possibility for everyone to enjoy a safe, satisfying, enriching, productive, and affordable online experience. These were some of the takeaways for, for the session that I had with these four women on access, connectivity, and inclusion. I would also like to share some of the activities that Pika, uh, Picasso has been involved in this year. One of them is the Pacific Hackathon. This is the EU-funded event under the UNDP Public Finance Management Project. We hosted this event in association with the University of the South Pacific, that NZ, um, Samoa Information Technology, uh, Technology Association, Pacific Island Association of NGOs, and Tonga Women in ICT, with four sponsored hubs located in Vanuatu, Samoa, Tonga, and Fiji. This was a hybrid event held in April 12 and 13. The aim of hosting this event is to find an ICT-based solution to a problem state with this problem statement that was provided us by the Pacific Islands of NGO that will allow them to amplify Pacific voices with all the requests that they were receiving from different member countries. The hackathon allowed Picasso to connect with young innovative technologists in the Pacific. It provided an opportunity to learn from each other, other in designing a solution to a Pacific problem. The event also allowed PKSOC to build mutual partnership with techies community in the Pacific who can influence the drive with digital transformation in the region. It also allowed us to have meaningful partnership whilst building a network in the wider community. It is also our vision to have a sustainable techies community to build sustainable tech solutions to resolve issues faced by our Pacific people. PSOC also hosted a Girls in ICT Day virtually on the 28th of April with the theme Access and Safety. We had a panel of four speakers 
all Pacific women working in STEM fields, sharing their stories and experiences in their line of work. We had a total of 135 people registered, ranging from women entrepreneurs, male champions, professional ICT women, women and girl groups such as Smart Sisters, um, and young students from the region and internationally. The aim of hosting this event was also to create an environment that empowers and encourages our girls and women to pursue careers in STEM fields, enabling both girls and technology companies to realize the benefits of greater female participation in the ICT sector and other STEM sectors through collaboration and partnership. It is our aim to host this event annually where Pacific girls and women can continue to share their inspiring stories with the aim to inspire the next generation into our ICT STEM career path. It is also our aim to build this network and increase female participation in developing ICT-based solutions in the region, as well as have more female participation in future hackathon events. PKISOC also receives uh, chapter admin funds from the Internet Society, and we were privileged to support the IT Society of Solomon Islands this year in their collective review of the draft Solomon Islands cybersecurity policy. This is a first of its kind and is spearheaded by the Ministry of Communications and Aviation. We, we can't wait to see the outcome from this one. I was also a fellow to the Asia Pacific Regional IGF this year, and it was interesting to hear during the event the different opportunities and challenges faced by civil society organizations. With all the digital transformation and the new way of doing things, it was highlighted that there is a need for more training and awareness to bridge the digital divide in this time and age. Cybersecurity, online safety awareness, digital literacy, the use of e-learning platforms. Tonga women in ICT are doing a great job in rolling out cybersecurity awareness programs to schools. And Sally will talk more on this later. It was also interesting to hear the need to increase skill sets, create workforce space at the national level for ICT-driven developments, the need for meaningful partnerships and working in a multi-stakeholder approach, and the need to secure funding to conduct activities, roll out projects at the national level. The API IGF gave PKSOC the opportunity to be part of the Synthesis Document Drafting Committee. This document is now published, as Maureen has just mentioned. The PKSOC board members and former board members like Andrew and Save had the opportunity to meet directly with the PNG Minister for ICT, who was present at the event. He was keen to learn more from us and was keen to support PKSOC activities especially hosting the next Pacific IGF. PKISOC is working towards a multi-stakeholder approach to host the next Pacific IGF in 2023, including providing an avenue where our youth voices can be heard. We have started reaching out to potential sponsors for this initiative, so don't be alarmed if we come knocking at your door. If you have forgotten everything that I've previously mentioned, please take heed of this. Civil societies are your voices in the local communities. To those looking to invest in national or regional activities, projects, in seats, please come make meaningful partnerships, come collaborate with us so we can cooperate and work together in a multi-stakeholder approach to advance internet governance in the globe, the seats, and especially in the Pacific Island countries. Thank you for having us share our experience and journey. Thank Thanks, you so Maureen. much, Natisha. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, and uh, uh, as you can see, Tracy, it's a very exciting time within the Pacific, and Natisha's uh, done a great job uh, leading leading the, that um, that uh, plan. So now we're going to move on to Salu. Salu, just to going to. Um, elaborate on on uh, some of the things that are actually happening in Tonga. 
Stellar. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, greetings from Tonga, Maloyele. Um, my name is Selka Ovaka. Um, I'm also um, a board member for our PICSOC, and I'm currently um, the president of Tonga Women ICT. And I'll quickly run you through a short pre presentation um, on some interesting things that we are currently doing here in Tonga. It won't take a lot of your time. Um, I hope you can see my screen. Okay, it's very colorful because it's early morning here. It'll keep me up and about this morning. Again, um, I'm part of Tonga Women ICT group. Um, if you are wondering where Tonga is, Tonga was hit by the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hapai volcanic eruption early in January this year followed by a tsunami where we got disconnected from the world, uh, no internet for a couple of weeks. And that was very frustrating. And it um, was an eye opener for um, our government, um, the importance of having um, policies and having backups with regards to, um, to the internet. Um, here are a few, um, I'll take you through a few, updates of what um, we have been up to, like PICSOC. Um, we have been pretty busy this year, maybe because the borders are finally open. Um, I'll quickly talk about um, Tonga Women ICT, also some ICT happenings here in Tonga, challenges and way forward. Um, Tonga Women in ICT is a group of girls, young girls and women, um, who are very passionate about um, ICT, the internet and um, everything around it. It was established in 2018, but due to um, um, funds not efficient enough, uh, we were only registered in 2021 as a nonprofit organization. Currently, we have um, over 30 members um, who all have permanent jobs, um, full-time jobs, but we contribute to Tonga Women ICT voluntarily. Um, our vision and mission is to allow women and girls to enter the industry without fear of discrimination um, and also giving them the opportunity to enter the industry um, transformation um, better. Um, we also, also the empowerment and everything exciting with regards to transformation in ICT. Um, you will hear Twit being a part of this um, journey here in Tonga. Um, a few of the things that we currently are involved in. Um, we we join multi-stakeholders from around the region um, and um, internationally, um, corresponding and co conducting and providing technical training for not just the TWIC members, but also for the community and whoever is interested. Um, as mentioned by um, Leticia, we have for the first time um, jo uh, done a awareness training, a community outreach to schools, um, to all the schools here on the main island in Tongatapu. Um, we have so many islands, so maybe next time we will reach out to the outer islands. But this year we were fortunate enough to go to every school here in Tonga, high school, um, young students, and um, talk about cyber safety and being safe online. And um, we also signed an MOU with uh, CERT Tonga and we worked hand in hand with CERT Tonga in um, reaching out to the community with regards to digital literacy and cyber safety. Um, a part of our members of our groups have taken um, leadership training, uh, Get Safe Online um, training, and a lot more other trainings. Um, a few projects that we were also a part of um, was um, funded and sponsored by Oak Tree Foundation in Australia. And this was um, with uh, contributing to us reaching out to the community. I think one of the main roles that we do is reaching out to grass level um, 
getting them to understand more of um, how the internet works, how to be safe online. And since um, our policies, um, our bills and acts are updated to, up, to, to be updated with technology, we are also trying to get them to understand that at, the, at, the, at that level. Um, Tom was women in ICT also um, produced the gender scorecard report for Tonga that was funded by World Wide Web um, Foundation. We were very fortunate this year to get a US grant um, to push STEM and awareness here in Tonga, and that is currently running this year and next year. Um, we play a big role partnership with PICSOC um, with regards to Women in ICT Day and community outreach in the region. Um, ITU with also Women in ICT and uh, many more. Um, here are a few snippets um, of um, our journey so far, reaching out to schools, <clears throat> um, having panel sessions with um, AGO office, police, um, uh, education, cybersecurity, um, and many more. We're very much supported by the government, by our Prime Minister, um, Honorable um, Huakave Meiliko, uh, who is also an ICT and picks up uh, champion, um, Honorable Sia Sovaleni. Um, more updates from us signing TWICT, signing the MOU, um, regional representations in a lot of regional meetings, technical trainings um, conducted by EPNIC, also GFCE, Sherry and Saya. Um, that's also um, um, a lot that has happened this year. Um, a few of our members with um, very different um, backgrounds um, that contribute to the hard work here in Tonga. Um, these are updates um, in the ICT field in Tonga here for just um, last month and this month, uh, where we have e-commerce coming up with platforms um, available to the community here in Tonga, uh, Pacific um, availing a satellite bandwidth, um, GFC Pacific Hub visiting Prime Minister, um, also very happy to announce um, we had a few of our young students go to a um, regional, um, no, that was an international event um, of um, global innovation. Um, a few of our uh, USB students had attended and that was um, an eye opener for Tongans that um, these events happen and then young people here in Tonga can also um, contribute into innovate, innovations in technology, even if we're a small island nation. Um, that was um, very exciting and everyone was happy about that. Um, a few challenges that we have, of course, the funding and um, the pace of change. Technology is uh, changing very, very, very fast here in Tonga. It's updating very fast, but um, the people's mindset is very hard to, to change and to get them to um, understand and to be on the same pace as um, as those that are in this space, um, capacity building, time constraints, um, uh, more knowledge in this field, and um, yes, the state of mind and acceptance to te technology stay change. Um, way forward, search more for more funds. Um, provide and be available for more um, awareness trainings for members and the community. Um, we need office space currently. Twigged, um operates on the go. There is no office space. Everyone is um, operating from home or from their office. And we regroup in a coffee shop every time we need to meet. Um, so that's how uh, we have been operating. Uh, as mentioned, everyone has a full-time job, so everyone is um, very busy. And when we have time, um, we come together to meet, to catch up and to plan for uh, new programs. And um, I'm very proud of the team with um, what we've done so far 
even though everyone is so busy. Um, and the very important thing also of multi-stakeholder um, approaches, regional, local, and international to build network. Um, I'm very happy to be a part of this session. I I was the one that asked for a wake up call. I, uh, I really wanted to uh, share um, things that have been happening here and letting the network grow um, from there. So I'm very happy to be a part of um, this morning's session. And thank you very much. Uh, if anything, um, I can answer later on. Malo apito. I hope you don't leave now. I hope you're Thank awake. you so much, Sally. <laughs> and I, I think it's very important that, um, you know, especially for Tonga, which under, uh, you know, sort of like underwent such a, a, sort of like a, tra a tragic uh, disaster um, uh, in there uh, with the um, with the earthquake. And, and, and um, so it's really, um, you know, it, it really is um, great to see that things are happening and people like Sally are working their butts off and um, on their islands to make sure that um, you know that that, um, that that ICT development continues. And uh, so, thank you, Sally, for that. Um, now, I I don't see. Oh, hang on, I do. She's just arrived. I see Dulcie has actually just arrived, and um, so she was the last. She's the last person in our in our um, in our list of Pacific um, sort of remote participants. Um, and we, um, you know, uh, we normally just have a, um, a round table, and I guess we're having a round table of, of remote participants first. Um, and uh, the last one for us is um, Dulcie, and I noticed too that Deirdre Williams has arrived, which is really, really good to see. Um, so, Dulcie, if you, are you sort of um, uh, available? I know she's on the list. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yes. Can you? OK. Um, yeah, we can. Very good. OK, so um, first of all, thank you so much for the to the committee for giving me this opportunity to present to you um, what is happening in Vanuatu and especially on a project known as my video okay. sorry yes especially on a project known as smart islands um smart islands is a is a project that is uh, um basically um it's owned by the government of Vanuatu and is implemented by the ITU um and it's based in South Maliku, central islands of Vanuatu in an island called Malikula. So it is a global project uh, piloted to try on what can smart island uh, be used as, an, as one of the options of approach to connect the most remotest uh, areas. Um, it started back in 2020 and um, I think it's, I think it's growing because I can see that there are a number of countries that are already requesting the ITU to assist them with the same approach that is being delivered. So what happened uh, basically is to um, get all the, it's a multi-stakeholder approach that we are, um, we are um, uh, delivering here in Vanuatu. So it's getting all the partners together including the government uh, institutions who are ready to deliver their service federally to these remote islands. But basically, there is a, uh, as a start, there is a, a, a analysis and uh, assessment of what really the needs are for these um, communities. So there are seven communities and an island, and, uh, and which is why it's called a smart island. Uh, uh, that um, were remote, but they're very close to Port Vila town. That's like 30 min 35 minutes away from flight and then six hours by cargo boat, but still it's remote. And, the, and, it's a, it's, and it's a reason why the government has chosen the site to be the smart island. And uh, because of the quality of service, 
that is very, uh, I'll have to take it back, it's, it's quite low. And so we had to do the assessment first to find out the priority needs. What is it? Is it because of the education or is it the uh, health or uh, business investments? Of finance. So during the assessment, we found out that there are three areas that need priorities to focus on, which is the education, health, agriculture, and finance to sub, uh, supplement. That is having access to uh, e-payments. So we started off with those um, sectors, work with the government institutions who are responsible, and at the same time, through the ITU, um, seek the collaboration for the other UN agencies who are willing to support. And uh, I have to thank, being an Ivanuak, I have to thank all of those um, uh, development partners who were prepared to support the project, the rollout of the project. As we speak today, um, on the 4th of November, it was a very first, um, uh, may I say first uh, delivery of the federal training, the, the federal um, um, uh, meetings uh, that happened, and it was an eye opener for all these uh, people in the area, and uh, and basically it's, it's great for all of us who were there to be part of this um, great event because they've never experienced this before. And having to listen, for example, to the the police um, giving them training about how to get a electronic uh, uh, police certificate clearance is 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 overwhelming for the people in that area. So um, I have a lot to share, but I'm going very um, short with the key activities that happened in the last uh, um, three years. And um, and uh, and I hope that uh, there'll be more coming. Uh, and basically it's uh, now what's coming up is the digital um, training, which is one of the priority things for us to do. And it's not just for the, uh, the, for the ITU, but it's for all the stakeholders who are involved in this project, project to be part of the digital training, to run digital training, either federally or face-to-face, -face, but face-to-face -face for a start is important. And that's, I think basically that is what I want, I'm prepared to share with us all this morning. Thank you, over to you. Hey, thank you, Dulcie. And I think that what it um, highlights too is is that um, ITU is uh, very involved in um, in our in the Pacific region, just as the the, the Caribbean te um, Telecommunications Union is very involved in the uh, in the Caribbean area. And um, as I mentioned before, um, you know we really did appreciate uh, that um, the contribution that uh, CTU made, um, and especially I have to mention Nigel. Um, because he was there. He was there just every meeting that we attended as we were preparing for the Pacific IGF. Um, he was there and it was it was really good to see. And, and, and Dulcie, um, Letitia and uh, Cherie were, were there too. But so I think we finished our um, our remote participants, uh, participants um, presentations. And I'd now like to move it over to Cherie who can um, join Tracy in managing the, the real round table for the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I know you'd asked me to give a um, cyber update from the Pacific, but I think that uh, Selu gave an outstanding update with her photos. And so thank you, uh, Selu. I wanted to take this time. Uh, first of all, this has been, if you'd noticed, our women in the Pacific are awake at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock in the morning on their time to give this presentation. This has been a community effort for us. Uh, Maureen dragged me along to this, and I dragged our girls. And uh, this has been a three-year journey. Um, and along with our male colleagues, you can see that there's a lot of things that are happening in the Pacific. And and Tracy, you know, I um, I know I am sorry that we have taken over this session. We have invaded this session all over again. But when you ask us to do something, we bring our A game. 
And uh, again, thank you, Letty and Selu and Maureen and Delcy. Um, really amazing updates. So as a way forward for us, uh, thinking about uh, the community effort and our, you know, just our ministers that are champions, we're just looking to uh, carry on with the coordination and the collaboration across the different uh, uh, groups, whether it's with the law operators network, with the um, cyber inci um, incident response people, the internet governance, all the chapters, you'll see uh, women in IC as well as the smart cities. Um, we're just bringing everybody together uh, to work together for the good of the region. So regional cooperation is something that we're aiming for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sherry. And um, we are about 45 minutes through our session. But I think we're having a SIDS IGF, mini SIDS IGF going on here, just, just right in this room. So it's fantastic. So thank you very much for that. those reports. and. All the updates, um, really, really, well, I was talking to my colleague, S.G. Rodney on the right here and saying, my goodness, how is the Caribbean gonna compete with this? So to do that, I'm going to ask um, the Secretary General of the um, CTU to try his best to compete with that and to give us an update on the Caribbean. It's only, all of you guys online, really have done very well, all of the women online. Let's say again, the women, well done. So now we're gonna have some men talk. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tracy. So good day, everyone. Um, no, I can't compete with those very excellent, very excellent presentations. Um, but just to give a little perspective from the CTU, um, and there's a lot to cover. I, just give you a high level view that we, yes, held uh, in partnership with the Pacific Islands and other stakeholders the first um, small island developing states uh, internet governance forum. Um, we owe a lot of that to, to Tracy as well. He's been a driving force uh, in the Caribbean as well as in this dynamic coalition here. And um, we tabled the idea and we were able to pull it off in, in very short order. Um, using the virtual platforms. It, there's still a lot of planning, as, as you all know, that goes into these, even if it's a virtual meeting, there's still a lot of cost involved. Um, but we were able to successfully pull it off and have some very high level um, speakers, um, including some ministers from both regions, and also the UN envoy for technology, Amindeep Singh Gill, who's here. And I, I found the discussions to be quite engaging. So the entire, IGF was, it was a three-in-one type of event. So it included the 18th Caribbean IGF um, because the CIGF has been running for 18 years. So it actually has been running longer than the UN IGF. Uh, so that's something that we are proud of and something we want to celebrate and continue um, this engagement. Uh, the CIGF itself allows us to, um, and we'll be out of that process, which I wouldn't get too much into today, uh, and there will be another presentation on the, that Nigel, who is not here, unfortunately, he had a conflict with a meeting in Trinidad. And um, he he'll be speaking on the, I think it's the NRI um, forum about that. But we've developed a internet governance policy framework that guides our regional governments on uh, internet issues in about four core areas, including infrastructure, security, exchange points, and so on. That was followed by the, the youth IGF. Again, for the first time, we had a Caribbean youth IGF. Um, it wasn't just, it wasn't planned by us for the young people. It was planned by the young people for the young people in, in the region. Um, again, I wouldn't get too much into that, but the way that they promoted it, uh, using TikTok videos and so on, was very creative. And in fact, as a part of the our plan to reach a wider audience, because what we found is that really for uh, these discussions to be effective and the spirit of uh, the IGF, you really want a, a wider audience. You don't want to be talking to yourself all the time. And we engaged, um, at the recommendation again of Tracy, a, a local DJ, quite popular DJ Anna, and um, we got our social media uh, engagements went through the roof, um, way beyond uh, I don't remember the percentage, but in, this, in the order of over a thousand in terms of engagement. And I wish we had engaged her earlier because she brought, you know, her following and um, 
brought the issues down to you know a level of, of um, discussion because very often too we talk about IPv6 and these kinds of things and people you know why, why should we care about that so we want to always make the language accessible and the big one of course the SIDS which took place on two days 25th 26th the challenge will always be when we're trying to collaborate with the, the, the other side of the world is the time frame as you saw you know the challenges here what time it is there and even in planning it in promoting it um, I think it was who was somebody joined me um, to promote it on yeah yeah what? yes Sherry it was you Okay, right, right. Sorry, yeah, I was trying. It was a while ago, but yes. So early morning show. I don't remember what time it was for you, but um, you know, we were so pleased to have have you there uh, on local TV in Barbados talking about internet governance. So the time frame is a challenge. The, the timing is is a challenge when we're talking about doing this kind of live event. We wanted to make it convenient for you and com convenient for us, but we didn't want to have two separate events. We wanted it to be one event working collaborative, collaboratively together. Um, I mentioned, one sec. Right. The session was opened by Minister Davidson Ishmael from Barbados. He's the Minister of Innovation, Science and Technology. And he gave some context, because Barbados has also has a, where I'm from, Barbados, a little, another little dot on the other side of the um, Atlantic. Um, <coughs> Barbados hosted, I think it was, a, I shouldn't, because I try to remember the year, but a small island developing states conference, a United Nations uh, SITS conference, and therefore it has been also champion, championing, championing the cause of small island developing states, in, in particular now around issues of climate change, because that, I uh, heard the initiative of um, Vanuatu in terms of creating a digital, a digital twin. And, and the significance of that, the implications of that. We hope, of course, that you know the worst doesn't come to the worst in terms of climate change and that the world responds appropriately and uh, addresses the issues of, of climate change, which represents an exi existential threat to small st um, states. Um, we then had presentations from <coughs> For the first uh, discussion focused around cybersecurity, data protection, cybercrime, and digital justice. We had some fairly high level presentations on where um, people were. I was quite impressed with what was happening in, in Fiji and in Papua New Guinea as well, um, because cybersecurity remains a very big issue for, for small island states with limited resources, limited capacity in terms of strategy development, the infrastructure like certs to protect the networks and so on. Uh, we also then uh, had a presentation moderated by Bevel Wooding of ARIN, and I should say we had strong support from ARIN, from LACNIC, from ICANN, uh, from Internet Society, and the ITU. Um, this session focused on regional digital strategi strategies and the digital economy. Um, so we had an update from the Pacific, the Indian Ocean Commission, and also I gave an update from the regional perspective, what we were doing to drive the CARICOM single ICT space. Um, there is a, um, a roadmap uh, that was developed and approved by CARICOM heads of government, I think in 2017, to promote a single space. And one of the things I reported on was the, um, the fact that we were able to negotiate with the providers in the region to eliminate roaming charges. Significantly reduce. Our objective is to eliminate completely, but there were reductions uh, on the order of 90 something percent um, within the region, and that we thought was critical in terms of, um, well, creating a, a climate that is conducive for investment and also making it truly a common space for our Caribbean nationals. Uh, then we had a very high level opening ceremony. I mentioned the UN envoy for technology who spoke, and he uh, was very pleased to be participating in the session and, uh, in fact, challenged us to provide as part of the output of this SIDS IGF input into the Global Digital Compact. And I think we all re really ought to take up that challenge. So far from what I've seen, there is no input from the Caribbean. I don't know if there is from the Pacific Islands, but I think we have until about March next year to really make a submission. And I think we should do that. Um, we can collaborate, we can have a consultation, 
virtually and perhaps discuss some of the issues, even if it's a separate submission, but it, it, I think we ought to uh, make our voices heard with respect to the Global dig Digital Compact. Um, we also spoke uh, following that on the internet and the environment, the issues around the energy consumption of these large data centers and cloud services and things like cryptocurrencies and mining of Bitcoin, uh, driving up the energy use and uh, uh, you know the need to look for sustainable um, sources of energy, renewable sources of energy, how do you deal with e-waste um, and so on in a sustainable way. And this is all of course part of the climate change um, discussion. Day two um, was kicked off by Maureen and uh, she moderated that first session, a round table on SIDS, IGF, the way forward. Um, and we had presentations there from APNIC, LACNIC, ARIN, and ICANN. Um, so we talked about, you know, what we want to achieve with respect to holding the CIS IGF, you know, what is next after this, and I don't think we've quite made that determination, but maybe with some feedback here and further discussion, we can agree on how we move forward. Um, we want to make it meaningful, we want to make it impactful, and ultimately I think one of my own things I'd like to see is that it amplifies our voice within international uh, ICT policy development uh, processes such as the ITU, um, such as ICANN, where I've raised the issue with ICANN as well with respect to our participation. And I think SIDS IGF gives us that opportunity, um, you know, it, it strengthens our numbers and, and raises our voices within these organizations. We spoke about telecoms regulatory issues in uh, the afternoon session. Um, we had Mr. David Cox, uh, chairman of Canto, the Caribbean um, Telecoms Operators Organization, Nigel Casimir, who's the deputy SG, um, and the John Jack, the deputy CIO of the government of Vanuatu. Um, Right, and that focus on whether the regulatory issues, by the way, we ha do have rap reports of the rapporteur. I don't know if it was shared, um, was it shared? Okay, shared online, we welcome your input. We do have to finalize it and really come up with some recommendations as well. So we, the rapporteur's report represents just a, r a record of what was discussed, but uh, we now need to pull out some policy recommendations or some uh, agree on, on the way forward. <coughs> um, the afternoon session was, um, Again, very high level, we had the director of the UNDP Global Center on Technology, Riyad Medeb, Medeb um, Stephen Burrow, who's the deputy director of BDT, uh, Mr. Vint Cerf, um, as you all know, Vint Cerf, and Jovan Kurbalaja from uh, Diplo Foundation, looking at issues of access, connectivity, and inclusion. Um, the last session of the day was high um, IGF panel access connectivity and inclusion uh, continued and for that we had presentations from Fiji Samoa um, Papua New Guinea and Geneva uh, do, 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 do. yes uh, again we spoke about connectivity meaningful connectivity the challenges to connectivity uh, for small island states the high cost of connectivity and the remoteness which makes it difficult um, for things like subsea fiber cables and the cost of maintaining those cables and so on. Um, as I said, that that is really just an overview of what was discussed. The rapporteur's report goes into greater detail um, and I hope that you um, are able to review it and, and provide some input so that we can refine it, conclude it and then pull out some, some recommendations on that. So I was very pleased, I will just conclude by saying I was very pleased with the collaboration that we were able to have and I, I hope that we can build on that and maintain that um, spirit of cooperation. Thank you. Thank you very much um, SG Rodney for giving us a, a very concise, thank you very much, update on three IGFs, the Caribbean IGF, the Caribbean Youth IGF and the SIDS IGF, the big one as he says. Um, we're going to come back to this topic rapidly because, the, as you see, the topic of our roundtable is the, basically what's happening next, but it says the IGF. But we do have one or two things to accomplish before that. Um, let's keep an eye on the time. We have approximately 
about 30 minutes, yes, yeah. And um, I'm going to indulge at the fact that we the last session of the day, see if we can squeeze any more time out of the tech team, maybe. Let's see. Um, so I'm going to enc encourage colleagues, as this is a round table, to open up, speak about the next steps for the SIDS IGF. So get your thoughts together. What can we do next? How can we collaborate? I've, we have the Indian Ocean team here from Mauritius. Um, we have the Pacific team, we have the Caribbean folks. Um, let's put our thinking caps on. What do we do next and how do we operate together? Before we do that though, um, we have uh, one of our uh, premier partners in the Caribbean and I believe in many regions, Internet Society, um, who is going to give us an update on what ISOC is doing in the area of a topic that is very, very important to all of us in the environment and climate change. So um, I'm going to now ask Shudan Osepa, who is the, um, the head of the Caribbean Affairs or Caribbean region. Shudan, you'll give us your, I know the title in ISOC changes regularly, so the precise title when, we, when you um, jump on. And you can let us know um, your role and uh, give us your um, update on um, this issue regarding climate change and how what ISOC might be doing to assist. Shannon, over to you. Shannon yes, is online tech much. team. Yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you, thank you very much, um, Tracy. Hello to all. My name is Shannon Osepa. I'm the director for Caribbean Affairs and Development at Internet Society. So, um, with respect to climate change and what we are doing at Internet Society or what we are trying to do, I think we should look at the, the key objectives. If you look what we are trying to do is we are focusing how can we get more people connected to the Internet, but not only being connected to the Internet, but being connected to the Internet in a secure way. So one big challenge that we are facing is while we are trying to get more people connected to the internet, there is a thing called climate change that doesn't respect that. And while we are building new infrastructure with climate change, we will lose all these um, infrastructures that, that we are focusing on. So that is why it is very important if we can focus on what we call disaster mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery so look at some strategies how we can make our infrastructures much more resilient most of the times especially in this we talk about internet governance we are talking about the internet but we need to realize we cannot have internet if we don't have internet uh, if we don't have telecommunications infrastructures so be it wired wireless doesn't matter you need to have a telecommunication infrastructure in place if you would like to have um internet um, um connectivity uh, I'm, I'm just highlighting a few um, um points where i think we can focus on it's very important if we can look develop a kind of a disaster risk analysis do a kind of disaster risk analysis per country because each country is different. You may have in the Caribbean some countries that are very that are vulnerable for natural disasters, some others are not. So you're not going to spend a lot of um, financial resources developing uh, very robust infrastructure if things might not happen in that particular country. So that is why a uh, disaster risk analysis per country is very important. And then based on that, you should um, develop your stra your strategies to mitigate um, and the consequences of natural disasters. So first of all, we can start, as I did mention, with the telecommunication infrastructure. We can, for example, construct hurricane um, compliant buildings in which all the equip equipment and exchanges can can be can be housed um, housed. When we look at the mobile networks, it's also very important that we install towers that can withstand, let's say, given um, hurricane strengths. I have seen, for example, in the Caribbean. I'm not going to mention particular countries right now, but where they were using uh, towers that can, that could withstand. Uh, hurricane, um, let's say, power or strength of category number two, while you can expect in that particular country 
categories number five um win strengths so it's just like asking for trouble you know so something else you can also um remove antennas when you know a storm is coming in that particular um, area and then re um, um, install them back after the hurricane so that's with respect to the telecommunication infrastructure if you look at the internet itself th there are some other areas but i don't have the time now to go um, um to make the deep dive on it if you look at the internet infrastructure itself we have a thing called the domain name system which is very important so we can have let's say more root servers in our region so you, you make you make the the the, the internet uh, infrastructure much more robust you can develop for example internet exchange points we have seen in haiti for example a couple of years back when the uh, hurricane struck haiti they were still able to continue to communicate through an ixp so ixps is not only they reduce latencies and other things that we have been looking at but they can also contribute to um, have much more resilient resilient infrastructure during natural disasters we can also for example um, promote more autonomous system numbers so you don't have to have your network hosted elsewhere you can have your all these networks networks to have their own what we call ASNs um we can also focus on alternative emergency systems and there are a few ways short wave radio communications that's when something happens satellite communications is becoming more and more very um, relevant and important especially given um, starlink and others that are promoting these kind of services so back then we were focusing a lot on what you call the geostationary systems geos but nowadays leos especially given these new developments they too can give a contribution to um natural disasters we should not forget for example the electric grid and water supply we i mean if we don't ele have electric power then we have a big problem as well most of our countries we have a lot of sun so we can make use of solar panels to start be being much more independent from the electric grid and that's the same that's uh, applicable also for water su water supply we need to focus on national and regional disaster coordination in the caribbean we have a so-called cdma that stands for caribbean disaster emergency management authority it's an caricom um, entity which deals and coordinates with um with um, national bodies we do have also CTU, Caribbean Telecommunication Union, rep represented by um, um, Rodney um, um, there in the in the room, but also others like CARICOM, uh, like um, Canto, excuse me, which is focusing more on the telecoms operators to, to, to see that they may have much more resilient infrastructure. But all by all, what I just wanted to raise I do have a formal presentation on this, but what I just want to raise is we need to start focusing how can we build resilient infrastructure. We cannot continue doing things as we have been doing them. And we do expect um, with climate change that things will become worse in the future. So let's 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 focus on that. Let's see how we can make more robust infrastructure in order for all of us to remain connected to the internet. What is our ultimate goal? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, for that. Um, I think that's a very good segue into our, the, the realities of what we face as SIDS. So while we do all of these um, you know, initiatives and projects and a lot of talking in some cases, in the case of um, colleagues in the Pacific love doing, we also have to be aware as, for example, what um, we spoke about in Tonga just recently. And as we all know, in many of our islands, we do have significant challenges with natural disasters of all types, earthquakes, hurricanes, sea level rise, um, flooding within your own country as is happening in my own country now, just massive amounts of flooding um, going on without um, seeming to be um, abating. We do have to understand how technology can help, but also how technology can perhaps even contribute to those challenges and, and ways to do things more sustainably and uh, work work together to make that happen. And that was a topic within the SIDS IGF 
as well. Um, so having said that, having had the reports um, from the Caribbean Pacific, which was planned, I'm going to open up the floor um, for all this. As, so we've gotten over the those who are scheduled and would like to speak. Um, so now we have the floor to be open for colleagues who may want to do some um, interventions. But I don't know if we, given that we have Mauritius in a room, if we want them to start. But can I ask you to do this though? If you'd like to talk about your IGF a bit, what's going on there, but also, given that you're new and hearing this all for the first time, I'm sure, how do you think what you are doing in the Indian Ocean and Mauritius can link up with what is happening in the Caribbean and Pacific? And what do you think a SIDS IGF or SIDS IGF process, how that can work and drive a platform for us to work, um, collaborate better on, together on? So I will hand over to um, Hunter from my from the Mauritius IGF to give some feedback on that. And again, I ask everybody to have to think about this. So I'm, I'm sure you're all raring to go now and there'll be no dead dead air once he, he completes his intervention. People are going to be jumping at the bit to contribute. So one more time to think again and then we're gonna um, have a nice robust discussion as we get to the end of the session. Andrew Nath. Thank you, Tracy. It's a really a very good experience to be together with all of you. And uh, in this uh, uh, Island Ocean uh, uh, Forum, it is really good. And I just want to take some time to tell what is a Mauritius Internet Governance Forum, how we started, and what how we've been doing in the Indian Ocean Islands. Indian Ocean Islands is just uh, around the uh, African uh, region. So the Mauritius Internet Governance Forum is a collaborative leadership event that encourages policy dialogue between state and non-state actors and among stakeholders on the issue of internet governance. We started it in uh, uh, 2017 and uh, uh, we've gone forward now we have also uh, gone forward with the Mauritius Youth IGF. And I am pleased that uh, my colleague, who is a facilitator of Mauritius Youth IGF, Mr. Taran Boudou, is together with us. So what have we been doing? We have been working with all stakeholders. Because the Mauritius IGF is hosted by Halley Movement Coalition, which is a registered NGO in Mauritius and works since 1989. We have been working on child and family welfare. So when we saw what the IGF is going to do forward, we said, let's work for children. So every year since 2017, we have been working and hosting the Mauritius IGF in the region as well and in Mauritius. And our theme have always concentrated on child welfare, children, and what the communities can do. And uh, uh, let me just, uh, Hali Movement Coalition. Th th thank you, brother. Yeah, and uh, uh, as I told you, uh, we started with this because we had the experience of working with the communities in Mauritius and with the government and all stakeholders. So when we took forward the IGF uh, issue, it was really well appreciated. Even the government, the private sector, the, the corporate uh, people, the communities, they were really very addictive to it and said, we are doing a very good job. Then we realized that why don't we extend this notion to the Indian Ocean Islands as well? So as we were working with colleagues from uh, Madagascar, colleagues from Seychelles, Comoro, we included Mauritius and all these islands as well. And we started it. So with the success of the IGF in Mauritius since 2017, our encounters with colleagues in the Indian Ocean Islands region motivated us to look for opportunities to take forward this sub 
regional agenda in the region. And uh, I would like to say today that we are really proud that it has gone forward. We were also prompted by the leaders of the African IGF during our attendances in the regions at the African regional meetings to see how this can be extended to our sub-regional level. So Mauritius IGF has succeeded in having a multi-stakeholder approach. It has taken some time for consideration and given our five years of experience in the field now, it is fully recognized at all levels. By the way, Mauritius IGF had an official meeting with the Ministry of ICT in Mauritius where the government assured us that it wants to be more involved with Mauritius IGF. And I, I am happy to, to, to repeat again what uh, Tracy just said, that our Minister of ICT was in attendance in one of your forums. The advantage of this IGF I'm now talking about the Indian Ocean Islands IGF, which, has been, which is being hosted by Hali Movement Coalition, is that the latter has the benefit of having the consultative status with the United Nations, the ECOSOC uh, and African Committee of Experts on the Rights of Child Welfare. So this has given us more uh, point to go forward. Hali Movement is also the elected member of the General Assembly of the African Union Commission, which is the ECOSOC. So as was the case at the beginning with Mauritius IGF, Hali Movement guarantees to provide some missing resources to see to it that new initiative gets started and the, that the event is hosted. And with our meeting today in this forum, we find that there are so many things that is happening in the Pacific and the Carib Caribbean region. We are not isolated as uh, islands. The Indian Ocean Islands will get together with you and will take forward what is happening. I still believe that people who are in marginalized region don't even know what is internet governance. And our next year's purpose, the Mauritius IGF, together in the Indian Ocean region, we are going to target the communities who are marginalized. We need to tell them, you have uh, the internet access, but do you know what is internet governance? How do you go when your children are getting into the internet? You as parents, you need to know what's happening, and the community needs to know, and we need to do advocacy sessions as well. Tracy, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Do you want your colleague to say anything as you read on a topic? Thank you, Tracy. Voice uh, of first young person, I think, speaking today. Well, first person who is ostensibly young. <laughs> Go ahead. So, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I am uh, Terem Blue. Uh, the youth facilitator of Mauritius uh, Youth IGF. So I completely agree with what Mr. Mahen just said, and as he did, I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of what is the Mauritius Youth IGF. So this year, it was the first edition of the Mauritius Youth IGF. It is a platform for local youth to learn about IG and voice out their opinions. It also serves as a bridge to the sub-regional Indian Ocean Islands youth community. So nowadays, the internet has, has become a part of our lives since we can practically find anything and do anything on the internet. For young people, internet is more like a friend. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the internet has become the primary means to maintain our daily lives. While technology and the internet have encouraged more digital activities, concerns over fraud, cybersecurity, and, and uh, privacy in cyberspace are definitely rising. So, for the Mauritius Youth IGF 2022, the main theme was reimagining the future of our internet. The three sub themes were cybersecurity and personal data protection digital skills and human capacity development, and uh, digital infrastructure. I also want to add that in IG, 
The need to include seeds in the process has been highlighted by IGF since long. Today, this group of states, which is home to over 60 million citizens, has a stronger voice on an international level, but it still needs support mechanisms to enable it to participate more actively in the IG. With the involvement of SEEDS in IGF, Mauritius IGF see that SEEDS are also an important stakeholder. The involvement of other countries and of other stakeholders, such as an international organizations, would help promote the views of SEEDS and facilitate our participation in the process. Mauritius IGF and Mauritius Youth IGF would like to give seed, uh, seeds a stronger voice across all sectors, including the internet governance process. Thank you. Thank you very much, Voice of the Youth, Voice of Indian Ocean, Voice of Mauritius. Thank you very much. Very glad to hear you. So, we've had some reports. You actually had some suggestions coming already from Mauritius, how we can work together. So this is not as in a decision-making body, but let's see if we can get some action items going from today's session online and in the room. So I, again, the floor is open, and I, I, I predicted there'll be no dead air, so let's see if you're going to prove me right. So yes, already, yes, in the, in the physical space, this the on-site part, I should say. I know it's a physical space. Um, we have one person wanting to speak. Um, introduce yourself and say who you are. Someone's going to speak there, um, camera guy, so they'll, they'll show who it is shortly. Go ahead. Good evening, everyone, and um, um, thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm June Paris. Um, I, I was a former MAG member. Um, now, I'm all, I was always, for the last few years, a member of the Internet Society Barbados chapter. I'm also um, involved with dynamic coalitions, especially SIDS and at the IRPC and um, the best practice forums and the NRIs. Um, yeah, we had a very successful um, CTU, SIDS, um, Youth IGF. And while we're still in the glow of that success, I think it's time that we started planning the next one um, while, while everybody's still excited. Um, I'm happy that we realize that we have, um, that we have a relationship with people in the, um, in, in, in the Asia Pacific um, because we have similar problems and similar landscapes and I th I'm happy that, we are joined, that we've joined together and that we will continue that, that friendship and that, that, um, that partnership. What I want to say though is that we need to, um, as my colleague said just now, lots of people don't even know what internet governance is. People think internet governance is being able to use a computer. Um, so we need to push that, we need to educate people, and we need to let people understand what internet governance is all about. There are various platforms, um, like School of Internet Governance, and there's also mentorships, and there's um, the actual possibility that we can join all the activity that is going on with the United Nations. We, even though we are, we are pretty strong in the Caribbean and the Pacific, we still need to link up and form partnerships with um, or northern, um, uh, northern, um, what should I say, people. Um, yeah, so what I'm going to suggest is that we, as I said, while we are basking in the glow of success, we need to start planning for next year. We also need to get more involved with the UN process. The UN has a process. You go through a process. And I've been saying for a while that we need, to, um, sub, we need to submit proposals so that we can become active and we can have our voice out there so that we can talk about the Caribbean, talk about the Pacific by submitting these proposals for next year. The proposals will be out er, um, early in the year. It, the, the call for proposals, as Tracy knows, you would have sent in a proposal, um, is, comes out um, early in the year and then we need to get that in so that next year we are stronger and we can actually um, be seen, we're more visible. We're visible this year, this year is a good year, but I want us to be more visible, and I want us to include youth and bring more people to the IGF. Thank you. Thank you, June. So June, summarizing what June has said, she would like us to get more active, get more visible, and not just talk about it, but actually do something about it. Submit proposals through the UN IGF system, 
get some sense proposals going, whether it comes from um, countries or individuals, let's get it moving and get our SIDS um, ideas and topics on the agenda. So thank you, June, for that. Online we have Deirdre, and then I'm seeing Rodney. Um, all right, so Deirdre, just hold one second. Rodney would like to respond to um, June's comment. Yeah, thanks. And just to reemphasize that, I think the Global Digital Compact, the fact that it is still open for input is the real next opportunity that we have. All right, that's a good one. Uh, think about that, segue into that. Let's get Deirdre, and then we'll go um, back into the back, back around. No, that there. Fantastic. Deirdre, you're online. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to see you all again. I remember Dalsi from Sharm El Sheikh, and that's a long time ago. Um, I've been at many IGFs, and my concerns are for the end users, the, the people who often get left out. And I have several points. One of them, I'm concerned about the fracture of voices that comes about as people begin to focus on individual local problems, sometimes at the expense of the global problems. So I'm hoping that the SIDS IGF will manage to find a balance between what are local concerns for small island developing states and presumably also landlocked um, little countries that are islands, even if they're not in the sea, and the global concerns that all of us have about the internet. Number two, um, one of the earlier speakers from the Pacific mentioned the difficulty caused by the fact that many people are not in this space. That's something that's very often forgotten. And we need to remember it because it's not a it's not a universal problem unless it's involving everybody. Um, resilience. Shannon spoke about resilience. One thing I noticed that before COVID, there'd been a lot of work here to provide community access through schools and health centers and places like that, which was grand, except it hadn't conceived the problem of being stuck in your house when you cannot go out, but you need the internet even more than you did before for all sorts of reasons. So if we can factor that into how we think about resilience, because COVID hasn't quite gone yet, and maybe it's got a big brother lurking in the background. Language, I mentioned in the chat, we're often separated by language or forced all to speak English, but between the Caribbean and the Indian Ocean Islands, we have a link of language. I wondered if the Pacific also links language across the Pacific, if you have common, apart from English, I mean. And my last point was electricity, and Shannon brought that up already. I always have to mention it. These, this service requires a great deal of electricity. And if you're talking climate change, then electricity is one of the bad news things, unless you have converted to other forms of generation. Thank you very much. Oh, and I think this is an excellent, excellent initiative. Congratulations. Thank you, Deirdre, and your uh, diehard support of our efforts. We really appreciate that. Thank you so much for your interventions, and we we are taking note of them. We have rapporteurs here, and we are actually taking note of everything you're saying to get this in our report, and hopefully have it pushed out beyond just uh, the this IGF meeting, but we're going to do something more than that this year. Uh, in the room, I'm seeing um, someone here who is in front of me. She can introduce herself and give some observations. Okay, good afternoon. I'm actually just building on what SG Taylor would have touched on before. 
My name is Nia Nanon. I am the Senior Research Analyst at the CTU Secretariat, as well as the Youth Envoy for the CTU Secretariat. And in participation of a lot of the youth activities at this IGF, the youth themselves have been having a lot of discussions about what happens after their participation at these sessions. What are the next steps? How do they go forward with meaningful, engaging inclusivity as the, the tangible action items coming out of forums such as these? So as a youth envoy for the CTU Secretariat, I would like to say that we are very committed to actively engaging the Caribbean youth on their feedback and recommendations to feed into the global compact. Um, as SG Taylor would have mentioned, feedback is open until March next year. And I would really like to put a proposal on the table to partner with the Mauritius Youth IGF as well as the Pacific Youth IGF um, initiatives to have not just a Caribbean youth voice incorporated into the global compact, but a collective CIS youth voice into the initiative. Did he drop the mic? Okay. So, okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tracy. It will be just one minute. Uh, I'm just uh, recording what Deidre said uh, about the language. I still believe that uh, in the Indian Ocean region islands, we speak Creole as well. And I have had friends in the Caribbean and in the Pacific, some of the islands, who also speak Creole. So I, I still think that Creole language can be taken forward in the IGF agenda. Thank you. And you made a raise a very important point about linguistics as well. So languages in the v in the various island regions in the Caribbean, you may be aware we have Spanish, English, French, Dutch, Papiamento, and is it Creole exactly? So, but it's a cost to do that. So, looking for somebody, some kind of kind of individual to help us bridge that gap. It's a very expensive gap to bridge. I'm not seeing any of the hands going up. And I'm going to take the, adv the chair's advantage and um, ask my colleague, Ashit Rodney, um, who was instrumental in driving, the, we used the catalyst to ensure this happened. We had the idea, we wanted it to, to happen. He said, well, let's just do it, and it made it happen. So now that we are moving on from the let's just do it and make it happen, what's next? We had some ideas come forward, so um, Ashit Rodney, you've heard some ideas. Let me give you the catalyst hat. What's what's next? Uh, thanks, thanks, Tracy, and thanks, Sudi, for a good suggestion. Um, a practical next step, really, is since we have the rapporteur's report, is to really um, share it, which has been shared already, and then um, appreciate any comments, any feedback, and really, as I said, that captured what we spoke about. But really, what we want to be able to pull out based on the issues that were raised some policy recommendations coming out of it. What do, what do we do? And really, I think it can feed into the same global digital compact that we spoke about. But what's needed for that is, one, the inputs, but I think we should meet at some point early in the quarter one of 2023. In fact, we'll have to meet before March, really. Um, <coughs> like I said, it doesn't have to be a joint submission. Uh, and I believe the parameters are, it could be an organization, it could be a group, it could be an individual country, and so on. Um, so we can make that determination then. In fact, it could be multiple, and it should be multiple submissions so that we um, leverage the our collective numbers. So a review of the report, a meeting in very early next year, I would suggest February at least, uh, at a time that is convenient for, for all the stakeholders concerned, um, and agree on some policy recommendations that we can take forward uh, as inputs to the Global Digital Compact. Um, I believe in terms of hosting it, and that's yes, we have to decide if we do want to have a second CIS IGF, but I believe also in terms of the CIS IGF that since we hosted it, although it was a hybrid meeting, we, we kind of hosted it on the Caribbean time, uh, it would be good to have it in partnership with um, another event, right, another region, uh, on, right, and um, we can have, it, of course, with the support of the CTO again, but um, again, driven and led, uh, or giving consideration for, for the that 
time zone in terms of how it is conducted, executed, uh, any of these stakeholders we go after. Um, in terms of financial support, most of them are global in any case, like ITU and ICANN, and I'm sure ISOC. Um, I'm sure they would, wherever it's held, um, have an interest in supporting it. Um, <coughs> the funding, yes, funding is an issue um, across the board. It, it was costly to execute even in a virtual environment, and the translation was um, be always a big cost, a big part of that cost. We had trans yes, we had. And the graphic work, you know, pr pr promotion of it, all of that, uh, the, ho the host. So we have to, I think also, as part of our discussions, agree on a sustainable sources source of funding. So we don't go after commercial type sponsorship packages because that's not really in the spirit of, of the IGFs. But I think there are enough organizations out there, like I can, like I said, there is, um, what is it you attended to call, um, Nia, for the proceeds from the auction for ICANN, for example. Grant program, I think if we can craft something, um, because and I've raised this with ICANN before in terms of the level of participation of small states within the ICANN development process, um, at the governmental level within GAC. Um, it is our problem, yes, but it is ICANN's problem as well, because if we don't show up, then it's not truly fully inclusive. So we understand the, that we don't have enough resources to follow everything, but that is very much as much an ICANN problem as it is our problem. So I think part of our discussion has to be finding sustainable funding uh, and multi-year funding as well so that we, are, we can plan much further ahead. Um, there was one other point I had. Oh, um, it is evident that we are and, and there is a global push to be more inclusive. So I was quite um, keen on the um, Tonga women in ICT. And I was actually going to ask if um, there was any synergy or if they were connected to the network of women, the ITU initiative network of women, and, and in what way. Because we are at the CTU have designated um, a focal point for network of women to be engaged in that process. And we supported the, uh, a lunch for the ne network of women in Trinidad when CTEL hosted its, its meeting. I've said that to say that we have to have almost a track um, specifically fo focusing on in inclusiveness and, and gender and women in particular um, in whichever one we do next and we can see how we craft that but also equally youth uh, within that, that track as well and I believe that they should help to, to plan and execute. So the suggestion that Nia has put forward in terms of the youth, um, definitely we should have that collaboration and I'm not sure if you were involved, um, what's, what's your name again? Terrell, okay. Um, the the ITU young people, Generation, Generation Connect. Connect. I, were you involved? Generation Connect, okay. But there is a sort of a network that is forming around this Generation Connect. Um, they met in Kigali prior to the WTDC, and most of the young people who are engaging were part of that. So basically, we can leverage that group to help again plan because we don't want we don't again we don't believe we should plan it and invite the young people, we believe the young people should plan it, promote it the way in their own creative ways and put it, uh, the topics that are important to them. So I agree with that collaboration for the young people. So um, I can write this down. <laughs> oh, it's been kept great, wonderful, save me some work. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I believe the like, practical next steps would be to get the input and maybe agree on a timeline for that if we can get it by at least mid-January, have a meeting in early February, agree on some policy recommendations to go forward and how we're going to put them forward um, to the Global Digital Compact, and then make a final determination as to where and when we can possibly host um, the second CIS IGF. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, SG Rodney. And um, I think on that note, we, we, we put our thinking caps on both colleagues who are in the room, colleagues who are online, colleagues who will hear this afterwards in the recording, and, and press this forward as opposed to leaving it on the, you know, in Addis, leaving it today's date, and come back to this next day, which is a challenge we have in these, these environments. I would like to add to that and to make that happen, we want to get a collaborative platform going. I need, we say, we say it every year, unfortunately no one 
who either puts up their hand to do it, does it, or no one puts up their hand. So I'm going to ask, again, can someone put up their hand and, and drive a collaborative platform? So all the things we just said, talk about, you're going to put in a report, it's going to exist, it's going to be somewhere, but it's, don't come back and look at it next year and say, oh, we, we didn't do that. So I'm hoping that we can get something moving that we can all work together on. And not, I don't mean a website, it doesn't mean a website or anything that dramatic. Something that we can work together on, as simple as a chat group, maybe something a little more um, robust that we can collaborate on planning, June for, uh, proposals, actions. So when we have these meetings, they're not like, oh, well, let's start again and talk about it. What did you discuss in, in, De in December? No, we already have discussed it and we're pressing it forward. And now we're doing it not in the Caribbean, on the time zone in the Caribbean or the Pacific time zone, or the English, we're doing it in our own time zones, at our own time, but it's happening in real time. In fact, I think if we look at what we're doing across the oceans, we pretty much cover the entire time zone so that people can work on stuff at different times of the day and it will, it will happen. So before we end, a hand up. Uh, put on the record in terms of so this for me it goes beyond I mean it's we call it the IGF and this is a dynamic coalition and says but um, I think we have to specifically also agree on a strategy for engaging with ITU with ICANN um, and with it specifically those two ITU and ICANN because uh, because of the resource constraints um, we had the situation which I didn't talk about where we had a candidate in fact there were two candidates from small island developing states for some very serious positions in the ITU, including Deputy SG and Director BDT. Um, collectively, if we work together, we are able to advance our interests, advance our people within these organizations to draw more attention to it. So I think this can be the vehicle through which we push that collaboration outside of IGF, in ICANN, in ITU as well. And I think that should be one of our very specific objectives as well. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you, Ronia. 100% agree with you. I also, I also thought you were putting up your hand to be the collaborative tool guy, I'm not sure, but um, is there um, anyone who's, who puts up their hand and says, look, I'm going to champion this and drive this collaborative platform so we could end the session with a definitive move forward to get all the stuff that we've just talked about going, looking for a hand, online or in the room. Hmm. No hands as yet. We s a hand to do it, not to say what should be done, a hand to do it. This is the problem, right? Get it done. If I do it, everybody has to support me. I voted, I, I'm, I'm sure. No, no, there's not, this is, no. This is not, hap this is not, we leave this room, we forget about it, trust me. I'm hearing Sherry, I don't, I'm not pushing back on you, but Sherry already has said, if we support her, she's going to do it. I propose a nomination cease, and we assign Sherry to do it. In the chat, who's that? No, I don't see a hand go up. There's, I think you're imagining her. hand on the chat. The secretariat, CTU secretariat. Yes, yes, yes. CTU secretariat. I'm, uh, it looks like that's Frank Kohler. Frankula, let's hear what you have to say. Are you supporting Sherry or you have another suggestion? Definitely, I am supporting Sherry. I am supporting the CTU as well, as I indicated in the chat. Uh, as you mentioned, the focal point, the CTU's focal point for the ITU's network of women, and that person is me. So I would reach out to those who I can reach out to to ensure that we have an inclusive um, engagement and we plan accordingly going forward. So, yes, full support from the CTUN and the Network of Women. All right, so I'm gathering, and just so I could summarize, Frank Hollis has put up a hand to talk about the Network of Women and linking up um, that suggestion that um, SG Rodney had made. Also supporting, I think, the unanimous consensus, we're going to call it, <laughs> in the room that Sherry will be the catalyst to drive this. Um, collaborative right. platform forward. She's now going to respond to that uh, proposal. Let's see what she has to say. Sherry? Um, 
um, and, and I have to put on my MAG hat on because uh, I've been a big supporter of the Global Digital Compact. And uh, I think that what SG is saying is very important and that's why I'm putting my hand up because um, when we had the SEEDS IGF, Albert Daniels from ICANN tried to push something for SEEDS through ICANN and through the survey. And I don't know if anybody uh, you, you know, filled out that form, but there would have been potential there for, for us. And so we've got, we've got another opportunity here through this Global Digital Compact. And, and you know, yes, it's nice to wait until February, but we could just go from here and start up a Google Doc and just start putting things into it and, and see where that gets us. Thank you, Sherry. And you know the principle KISS? I don't, I'm not going to say it online. But let's KISS this, right? So, um, Sherry, thank you very much. And um, we look forward to you. We have the, I know the DC sets list, there's, you know, there are about 80 people on the list, maybe 10 people do say anything. But maybe this might drive more people to get involved. So just pump it out on that list. And um, for those who haven't joined that list, um, you can do it by going to the IGF website, et cetera, and see how to do it. If not, just email me, and I'll add you directly, right? So um, it's all link I'm on LinkedIn. I'm everywhere. You can talk to me afterwards. I know you've kept the tech team as long. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I also I wanted to shout out to Tina Captioner, who has been getting some credit, some, some kudos online for being an excellent captioner. Thank you so much, Tina. We appreciate that. Thank you, tech team. And with that, I think we're going to end our 2022 um, DC SIDS roundtable. And by the time we get to next year, we're going to have a lot of stuff to report, I would imagine. We, this year, we have the SIDS IGF. Let's, can we top that? I think we can. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.